Zechariah chapter 13, we stopped last time at verse 7, so we will proceed from verse 8. Zechariah 13, verse 8, And it shall come to pass in all the land, saith Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part into the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will fry them as gold is fried. They shall call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, Jehovah is my God. Chapter 14 Behold, the day cometh for Jehovah, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. And I will assemble all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And Jehovah will go forth and fight with those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, toward the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Ye shall even flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And Jehovah my God shall come, and all the holy ones with thee. Verse 9, And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Jehovah, and his name one. Verse 11, And man shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that all that are left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And then verse 20, In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto Jehovah, and the pots in Jehovah's house shall be like the bells before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto Jehovah of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more a Canaanite in the house of Jehovah, of hosts, of by the reading of the scriptures. <coughs> now, in him, we thought of Psalm 72. And Psalm 72 would be a very interesting uh, psalm to read together with this chapter and speaks of the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus as the great Solomon. But before he will reign as the great Solomon, he will reign as the great David to submit all the adverse forces and hostile forces under his leadership. And that is what we have also in the portion that we have read tonight. I just want to <coughs> re, uh, refer to the structure of the book. You, have, you remember we have first the book of visions, uh, chapters 1 to 6. Then we have passages 7 and 8 that we had many times the expression about the oracles of the Lord. And then the last part of the book from chapter 9 to chapter 14 is divided in two portions. We have seen... Chapter 9, 10, and 11 is the burden, and so is also chapter 12 to the end, the burden of the word of Jehovah. The word burden, of course, occurs more, but the expression, the burden of the word of Jehovah, only occurs three times. Two times here in Zechariah and one time in Malachi. An in interesting point also to uh, remark is that in this last burden, so from chapter 12 to the end of chapter 14, we have 18 times in that day. We have three more times earlier in chapter 2 and 3 and 9, the same expression. So 21 times together in the whole book, in that day. And that refers to the prophetic uh, day, of course, introducing the millennial age. That day really closes the present dispensation and uh, ushers in the age to come. As Hebrews speaks about the age to come, the world to come, that is what the day of the, that day does. The dead day concludes the present dispensation, or I'm not saying the rapture, of course, it concludes the present things and brings us then under the direct rule of the Lord Jesus. We will see uh, a reference to that also later. Now, we stopped in the middle of chapter 13 the last time, and um, this chapter is rather difficult. 
But we have seen in verse 5 already a reference to the Lord Jesus. I want to just repeat or summarize very briefly the humiliation of the Lord Jesus. And we see in these chapters that we have read tonight, the portion that we have read tonight, many references to his uh, exaltation or glory, public glory. But the first step of his humiliation was that he came as a man, in verse 5, with no claims, just like John the Baptist had no claims, they said, are you the prophet? No. And so the Lord Jesus, who is really the true prophet, he had no claims whatsoever. In verse 5 he said, I'm no prophet, I'm a tiller of the ground. And we have mentioned that the last time, that that was because of the condition of the human race. The human race was in bondage, and so the Lord Jesus came as a bondman. It's really beautifully illustrated in the Hebrew bondsman in Exodus 21. If you want to look that up, then you see what I'm talking about. The Lord took the place of bondman on this earth. But it was because of the condition of mankind. A similar thought, but different words, you find in Romans 8, verse 3, where it says that the Lord Jesus came into the likeness of flesh. And so God sent his Son in likeness of flesh of sin and for sin. So the Lord Jesus was without sin, but he came very close to where we were. We were in bondage, and so he took the place of a bondman. But he was the perfect bondman of the Lord. Exodus 21 shows that. Then the second step of his humiliation was, in verse 6, that he was rejected in his own house. That is verse 6. What are those wounds in thy hands? That's what you have in Psalm 69, for example. That in his own house, in his own nation, he was rejected. And he will say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends, or my lovers. So he received how Israel rejected him. And even his disciples, were, uh, who were so close to him, they did not understand him. You find many examples of that in the Gospels, and in that sense he was wounded by those who were the closest. And, but then we get the third step of his humiliation, and that is where we stopped the last time, in verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. We have seen the last time the false shepherd, the foolish shepherd. Here is the shepherd that God can say, my shepherd. But here we see Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The sword was awakened against the shepherd, against my shepherd, the one with whom God always identified him. The heavens were open, the Spirit of God descended on him and rested and stayed on him, John 1. He was forsaken by God. Mystery of mysteries. And it says in verse 7, the man that is my fellow. That is again such a wonderful expression. Here we see his humanity and his deity, because he is God's fellow, in one line. It's really amazing. And we have noticed many times in Zechariah how these two aspects of the Lord's person, his humanity, his deity, are often very close together. And in fact, you cannot separate them. As the Lord is now, you can distinguish between his deity and his humanity, but you cannot separate them. And when you read John's writings, especially First John, you can, you can even say, of course, they are not mingled together, but even you have a hard time sometimes to distinguish between the deity and the humanity, because this is the same person we are talking about. But in this verse, we see then how he was smitten. So that is the third phase of his humiliation. Smite the shepherd at the end of verse 7. Now, this has consequences. And the consequences we see now in connection with God's government, because it's true, God has smitten him. But it is also true that the nation of Israel uh, delivered them, him up into the hands of the nations. And it is also true that wicked hands, as Peter says in Acts 2, have uh, put him on the cross. So the whole humanity is guilty of uh, the death of the Lord Jesus. And so here we see the consequences, or one of the consequences of his death, the sheep shall be scattered. And we see that in Mark 14, for example, when the Lord warned the disciples that the shepherd will be killed and the sheep will be scattered, he had predicted this. And we see that then already, when the Lord is taken captive, the disciples are uh, scattered, they flee. But also, to a wider extent, we can see in the beginning of the church when the sheep, the true sheep, that had been called by the shepherd, were scattered. See that in Acts 8, you see the persecution already starting earlier, and so they were scattered. But at the same time, the Lord says here, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. We have noticed already the last time those 
poor ones on the, in the flock. At the time that the Lord was with them, he bestowed much care on those poor ones. And so he did, even at the beginning, uh, after he was exalted and the Holy Spirit came down, the Lord bestowed much care on those little ones. So you can take it, the little ones who were there while he was still on the earth, you can take it as those who were there after he died, and you can also see now the prophetic line and think of the remnant that will be preserved during the Great Tribulation. He will uh, turn his hand upon the little ones. That is not in, in uh, chastisement, perhaps in discipline, as you find is the remnant going through the Great Tribulation, but it is also his hand of protection and blessing that we find here. And we have referred to Zephaniah the last time, the time before. You find more details about that also in Zephaniah. Now I want to ask your attention for a difficult point, and that is this. Verse 8. It shall come to pass in all the land. Now, you see, immediately there is this jump from what happened in the days of the Lord Jesus when he was on this earth and what will happen in the future. And so you have to think that in between verse 7 and 8, there is the time that we are the time of the church, of the assembly. And you remember that we have noticed several times in Zechariah that he goes from the first coming of the Lord Jesus right to the second coming. In fact, you cannot really separate them. They are distinguished, but you cannot separate them. The first and the second coming are in many ways linked together. And we find it many times in the prophets. Isaiah 61, referred to by the Lord himself in Luke 4, shows that there is this gap we often call it a gap, it's not a gap theory about the creation and, and so on. No, it is a gap between his first coming and his second coming. And we are in that gap, so to say. Now, <clears throat> what I also want to say in general, we see that the Lord, now when he speaks about the future in verse 8, he acts in two steps. First of all, he will strengthen the remnant, he will strengthen his people. Secondly, he will come in directly. And we have seen the last time also several examples how the Lord will strengthen the future remnant. And we have mentioned the remnant among the ten tribes, Ephraim. We have mentioned the remnant in Judah, representing the two tribes. The Lord will strengthen them and use them as instruments in his hand. So that is one intervention. The second intervention we see that is a direct intervention, as for example in 14 verse 3. Jehovah will go forth and fight with those nations. There you have his direct intervention. Personal. So now go back to uh, verse 8, chapter 13. It shall come to pass in all the land, says Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off. So this is the majority of the nation, of the apostate nation, under the Antichrist, will be cut off of the land. They will die in the judgments to come. And then one third, says, shall be left therein. You could read, for example, in Ezekiel, and I think also in Jeremiah it's mentioned, that this one-third is then going to go through great trials. And we see that here. It shall be left therein, so that is one-third that the Lord will preserve, but that one-third will then, in verse 9, be brought into the fire. And I will refine them. So here we're talking about the third that will go through the fire. And... Uh, there are other prophecies, like in Isaiah 6, that show that only one-tenth will be preserved. That is a portion that God reserves for himself in his sovereignty, and they will be there, like the 144,000 that are sealed in Revelation 7. God will make sure that they will be going through the Great Tribulation. There will be other believers among the Jews also who will be killed, the martyrs. But I, my point now is there will be those who will survive and will be preserved during the difficult time. And that is what we have here in verse 9. They will go through the furnace. Like Daniel's friends, they went through the furnace. Like uh, in Egypt, when Moses met the Lord, he saw the Lord in the fiery, in the burning bush. That was the expression I was looking for. Thank you. In the burning bush. And that is where the Lord was with his people. His people was in the burning bush, and he was with them. And that's exactly what we read in Isaiah 43. The Lord says, if you have to go through the waters, I will be with you. If you have to go through the fire, I will be with you. Now, that is what we have here in verse 9. And that is uh, found many times in the scriptures. But now, I want to make more, one more reference. That is Malachi 3. You could read Malachi 3. You find, in the beginning, the early verse of Malachi 3, refer to the same event. 
But then a, a bit later in Malachi, you see also some comments on the unbelievers, what they will be faced with. But now I want to make an application. You remember that we have said we read this book as in connection with historic events. We read this book as prophecy, so it really speaks of days to come. And we have said it has also spiritual lessons for us today. And it presents the person of the Lord in, on every page. That is a wonderful way that this book is written. It presents, as we have just saw in verse 7, the person of the Lord in so many different ways. But now the application, the spiritual application for us. What happens to us? And I, I underline this is an application. We are not, we will not go through the great tribulation. No way. We will be in heaven. Praise the Lord. But we are going through tribulations now, through afflictions. That is God's school with us. Romans 5, verse 3. Romans 8, 28. Many other passages in the New Testament show that. That we are going through the fire to be refined. The Lord speaks about that to Laodicea in Revelation 3. What you need to buy, to buy gold, purified. But uh, how do you, how do you got, buy that gold? By going through a process of refining and of affliction. That is how you buy it. And so, by going through those difficult times and afflictions, the Lord produces something in His people. The silver is refined. We have a beautiful verse in Proverbs 17, verse 3, I think it is, where He speaks about the uh, silver that goes through the fire, the gold that goes through the fire, and then the same verse says that the Lord, it uh, slips my mind now, but He tries the Spirit, something like that. He is trying, He is refining His people that goes through the fire. And you find this illustrated in the Lord Himself when He was on the mountain of transfiguration. You see how His garments had changed and how he, he was white as snow. And so that is God's objective to make, there is the Lord a model for us of course, but to make us conform to Himself. God is without sin. God is pure. And so is the Lord Jesus. But He wants His people to be conform to himself and that is why he uses this process of refining to make them conform to himself you have it in the first book of the bible that's not genesis that is job the first book of the bible describes this in much detail and uh, first peter comments on that there's a beautiful verse if it is needed and then the lord controls the time that he goes through that fiery furnace but he has a purpose and that is true for us today and so it will be true for the remnant in the future. Now, at the end of verse 9, we find, they shall call on my name. So that will be the result. We have seen, because of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, they will be scattered. Because of his rejection by the nation, they will have to go through the great tribulation. And because of all this, God is working in them then to uh, refine them. There are other passages, we, we don't have time to read them, but there is a wonderful passage in Isaiah 28 that speaks about God's dealings in discipline and how He will lead that remnant through those difficult days to produce something wonderful. It is Isaiah 28 from verse 14. He chastises this, the nation uh, with His words there and He will send the overflowing skirt, and we will come back to that with the King of the North in a moment. But my point is now, through it all, God will reach something. He will produce something in them. And at the end, the uh, prophet says, this is his wonderful counsel and his great wisdom. That is what is uh, in Isaiah 28. God produces something in his people, and it is according to his wisdom and counsel. That is similar to what we have here in Zechariah 13, verse 9. And then the result, they shall call on my name. In Psalm 50, there's a beautiful verse, I think it's verse 15, that says, In the day of distress, call upon me, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. That's the same idea. They shall call upon, or on my name. In, great, in days of great distress, in the days of Enosh, in Genesis 4, you find that for the first time. When Abram was all by himself in the land of promise, in Genesis 12, he called upon the name of the Lord. And so we may do that today. And so the remnant will do it. And in Second Timothy 2, there is an important verse that today in the day of ruin, we can call upon his name. You, you can study Second Timothy 2 about that. And you see the importance of the name of the Lord in the day of ruin. 
So that's our application. But here, of course, prophetically, we are in the days of the Great Tribulation, and the result that the Spirit of God produces in them, they will answer, excuse me, I will answer them, and I will say, it is my people. So God, he identifies himself with them. Lo am I, lo ami. Lo ami, that is the condition of the people since the days of Hosea. But then God will say to the same people, my people. And that is the remnant you find in in Romans 11. A remnant will be saved, and they will stand for my people. God will go on with these 10%, as I just said, Isaiah 6. And that will be my people. And they shall say, there is a response, Jehovah is my God. You find this beautifully illustrated in Thomas. Thomas, of course, was one of the the twelve, or one of the eleven. And in that sense, later on, he was a Christian, of course. But Thomas, in himself, is, as he came the eighth day to the Lord, and said, uh, when he saw the signs in the Lord's hands and the sight, said, my Lord and my God. That is what Thomas said. And that is really an illustration of the remnant, as you find here. They will say, Jehovah is my God my Lord and my God, like Thomas said. So they will realize the relationship, enjoy the relationship with the Lord. He will uh, identify himself with them, and they will respond to him. And that is what we can do today. 2 Corinthians 6 speaks about that, that God would...